Hello, this is Andrew. Welcome to Collaborative Learning. Today's book is Stout Hearts, The British and Canadians in Normandy, 1944, by Ben Kite. If you like my work, please like it, subscribe to this channel, check the playlists, and support me on Patreon and PayPal. The links to Patreon and PayPal are included in the description to this video. First, I'll describe the contents of the book, talk about what's interesting about it, then I'll move on to what you can get out of this book. Ben Kite is a retired British Major General with a background in military intelligence. He served in a variety of different roles in his 30-year Army career. This included operational roles with the Royal Marines and Royal Air Force units. He instructed at the Royal Military Academy at Sandhurst and is a graduate of the Higher Command and Staff Course. Kite is a fellow of the Royal Historical Society and the British Commission for Military History. Stout Hearts, the British and Canadians in Normandy, 1944, is organized in different chapters that study the different service branches of the 21st Army Group. The book's main purpose is to illustrate how the British and Commonwealth system actually worked as a whole with all its different services. There is an emphasis on describing the fine details of operational processes and tactics. So with this book, we explore the anatomy of a military force and how different components add up to produce a military victory. The chapters start in the following order. Infantry, naval support, engineers, artillery, air power and air support, military intelligence, reconnaissance, command and control, medical services, soldiers' lives, and armored forces. The appendices also add additional information. There are also many maps, photographs, and tables with technical information. As a whole, Star Hearts is a very detailed and heavily researched piece of work by a professional soldier that uses a great number of primary and secondary sources. These include archival documents, war diaries, and a great number of veterans' memoirs to provide the human aspect of all the points presented. So for the reader, ultimately, the mysterious black box of the British Army becomes alive and understandable. The student is taught by your author to understand how the British and Commonwealth forces worked in a multifaceted way. A secondary objective of the book is to stridently emphasize the strengths and of the British system and how sophisticated and competent it actually was. The 21st Army Group that fought in Normandy was the product of four years of trial and error in war. It was more advanced form of the British forces than the, the army that was defeated in 1940. I strongly believe that the study of organization is the most important first step for understanding World War II battles and armies, and this book fills an important gap. Without studying organization, an army is just a vague cloud, and the student of war is unclear about a lot of things. This organizational study of the Commonwealth forces is also aimed at addressing a major imbalance in military history. This imbalance is the wartime and post-war perception among certain historical camps that the British and Commonwealth forces were stymied in Normandy due to their failure to capture the early objective of Khan in the first days of the invasion. As a consequence of this failure, the reputation of the British system in World War II has suffered a lot. Their army has been perceived as being too slow moving and with poor military performance. It adds to the questionable viewpoint that the British and Americans were lower quality than the German and won only due to overwhelming numbers of material and manpower. I think that these views are overly simplistic, clearly incorrect, and this book shows you exactly why with hundreds of pages of details and effective arguments. And besides Ben Kite, there's a growing group of British and Canadian historians that have worked convincingly to address the anti-British bias. This includes Terry Kopp and John Buckley. A major contributor is also Mark Milner in his very good book, Stopping the Panzers, The Untold Story of D-Day. This operational and tactical history focuses on combat between Canada's 3rd Division versus the German 12th SS Division, to illustrate Major General Kite's very same points 
about the many strengths of the British system. It is a good book for students to read after Stott Hearts. So what is the final word about the British and Commonwealth forces in Normandy? I think the answer is quite clear. The British and Canadians actually fought most of the cream of the German army in Normandy, while the United States fought most of the second-tier German forces. So naturally, the elite German units, their Panzer and Panzer Grenadier divisions, would put on an extremely hard fight and defend Khan skillfully. The defense was very strong, and among the strongest in World War II. It's very difficult, if not impossible, to blitzkrieg a dozen elite divisions deployed in the defense on an extremely narrow front. The only way to beat such a force was to fight conservatively and wear them down with many blows over the course of two and a half months. Germans were eventually worn out and this allowed the Allies to break out of Normandy. It must be noted that despite this uh, concentration of elite forces, there was no German attack in Normandy that seriously threatened the Allies at the operational and strategic levels of war. Allied defense was on the whole quite successful. So why was the British system so steady? The chief strength of the British and Commonwealth was that they were extremely well equipped compared to the Germans and had this training sophistication to put these advantages to use. They had good supporting branches such as logistics and artillery. As a whole, the British system in 1944 was very reliable and their troops had good defensive power. They were a rock in the defense. The main British weakness was in the offensive. They had a very low number of infantry troops with lim limited what they could accomplish in attack in the majority of circumstances. It is this factor that won them the reputation for being slow acting. Ultimately, this was, however, of intentional design. The benefit of having extremely heavily equipped and supported combat troops and having few of them in the first place is that the casualties would have a natural limit. So it was a materially expensive way to fight, but it was stingy on manpower. By fighting in this way, the British preserved a lot of lives. By May 1945, it is a statistical fact that the British actually suffered a lot less casualties and prisoners than the Germans they were fighting the vast majority of the time. While the British system didn't provide stunning and fast victories in Normandy, they were able to break out and advance as fast as the U.S. Army once the backbone of the German Army broke in August 1944. The exploitation and reconquest of most of France occurred in a matter of weeks. So there was a British blitzkrieg in a way, and it was after the heaviest resistance was broken. The British and Canadians had a risk-adverse sort of competence. They avoided suffering big defeats most of the time, but also gave up the opportunity to score stunning victories. In the end, this was very healthy for democracy and consistent with the British desire to not suffer the same level of losses as in World War I. The British system preserved the most important thing to them, human lives. To some things, Star Hearts is one of the most important books about the Battle of Normandy. I highly recommend it to everyone, and I think it should be required reading. It opens the gateway to study of the British and Allied forces in the final year of World War II, and is one of the best books on the subject. I rate Stout Hearts a 5 out of 5. So that's what I think about Stout Hearts, the British and Canadians in Normandy, 1944. Please put your thoughts and ideas in the comments section. They always make a great conversation. I hope you find my review to be informative. Thanks for watching.